Welcome to the Sustainable Clinical Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Sarah Smith. I am a practicing rural family physician and the charting coach. This is the podcast for physicians and advanced practice providers who are ready to step back from the busyness of their clinical day to share ideas, question everything, and redesign their clinical day. We are redesigning clinical medicine to create sustainable clinical days and create time for our lives outside of medicine. Join us for discussions with world experts who are helping design sustainable models of clinical medicine and the physicians or clinicians who have discovered or designed sustainable models of clinical medicine for themselves. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind those of you who are working on backlogs, just check in the www.chartingcoach.ca backslash backlog dash buddies is a place you can come and do your backlog alongside fellow clinicians and physicians. So if you want to kind of hang out and have some ability to stay uh, on task for the two hour sessions, come along. We'd love to see you there. Hello and welcome back everybody. Um, Today I have with us Dr. Heather Falk, who is going to um, give us some information about transitions and some of the physicians who decided to stay after all. So this will be interesting. Welcome Heather and I'll let you introduce yourself. Well, thank you, Dr. Sarah. I am honored to be here. And I have to say, I love your accent. (laughs) Thank you. All right. So tell us a bit about you. Absolutely. So thank you. Well, I was initially a dermatologist and Mm -hmm. I did end up transitioning out. But right out of residency, I bought a small practice. So I got the experience of being a solo practice owner. And I had the practice for nine years. And about at the halfway mark, I woke up one morning and asked myself, are you happy? <laughs> it was I was kind of scared to ask that question, but I went ahead. And the answer was a little disconcerting because no, I'm not happy. And there were things going on in my personal life, but there was also some things going on in the practice. They they had nothing to do with patients, but um, mm-hmm. like, for example, my office manager who helped me start the business, she had this lovely husband and a young son, but her husband was dying. He had multiple brain aneurysms. And so she took a leave of absence. And so I was staying at night and doing all the insurance and billing and on top of everything else. And I was just feeling that this isn't really what I pictured Mm -hmm. in terms of, as, as we all know, seeing patients every 15 minutes, being really busy, the stress and the liability, managing an office, if that's what you're doing. And then seeing that, okay, training was really fascinating and you're with your peers and you're learning and growing. And then when you get into practice after a number of years, it does sort of become a bit like groundhog study, <laughs> lather, rinse, repeat. And I, I like to stress that that had absolutely nothing to do with the patients. I love my patients. I actually really love dermatology, but we don't necessarily know after a period of time how something's going to feel. Mm-hmm. And so I started getting the sense of, all right, this there's trouble in paradise. What am I going to do? And there's a lot more story here, but I won't go into those details right now. I'll let you decide where you want to go with this. But so long story short, I did a lot of things to fix it up before I gave it up. So I spent another four and a half years in practice. And then I did eventually end up selling um, the dermatology practice. Didn't know what it was going to do. Didn't have a plan. Didn't want to have a plan. It took some time off. And I became a career coach for physicians. And I, I've been doing that now for 14 years. And so I, I talk to physicians in all different circumstances and help them try to find their best path forward, whether that's find a way to be happier in medicine, do a combination of clinical or non-clinical work, or a um, number do transition out into all the different things that you hear about. And I actually have to say, I like love what I do and mm-hmm. I have no regrets. Nice. Okay. So you kind of speaking to that piece of that there's infinite possibilities within medicine, which is amazing and really helpful to know. Um, So take us back then. Why did you ask yourself, are you happy? Like, where did that come from? What was that about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. 
And I think it's, you know, obviously I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't happy. And I think there was stress in my personal life that was going on. And then I also realized that I'm a very introverted person. And mm -hmm. so seeing patients every 15 minutes, talking, 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 and giving out advice and really not getting to have deeper conversations, spend more time with people, as well as be in charge of their their medical health and the responsibility of it. I mean, you miss a melanoma, that could be really serious. You prescribe a wrong medicine, someone has Accutane and they want to jump off a bridge. Like there is that weight of liability that I don't think you really feel understand unless you are a doctor mm -hmm. and just running, running a business. So I think I, I felt like the, the joy that I have of helping people was not really being fulfilled in this way that I wanted it to. And you don't really, I don't think you really have an idea of how you're going to feel in day-to-day -day practice until you're not a resident. There's no one to, you know, the buck stops with you. Hmm. And you you can think about that theoretically, but until you're actually in those shoes, you you don't really have quite the sense of how it will be for you. And mm -hmm. looking back, because now when I work with my physician clients, I'll spend an hour with one person. Mm hmm and I'm usually doing most of the listening and asking questions and t and trying to help them understand their own roadblocks and help them move forward and help them make a transformation. So I think a lot of what satisfies us in um, the work that we do is what is the transformation or the change that we're helping with. So in medicine, helping people be healthier and with their skin conditions, that's satisfying. But to me, helping people transform their lives and really looking in, inward and figure out um, how to transform their thought processes and their actions to serve them. To me, there's nothing better than that. And, but mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't, I wouldn't have known that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell us about um, the decision to go solo because that requires things like running a business and setting up a business. Did you have business training? Is that something that you had done so that you could set this up? And why did you choose solo? What was the thought process there? It was, it was the only option besides Burger King, because when I finished my training and I, I did my residency in Miami, I wanted to come back to Austin, Texas, and nobody was hiring. Because a lot, you know, dermatologists, they like to hunt alone. They don't need to be with a partner. And I really had never thought of having a practice, but I was determined to come back here. And so I called around um, at every dermatology office. And one office said, call back tomorrow night and speak with a doctor. So I called back and he had just decided he wanted to sell his practice. Mm -hmm. So during the end of my residency, I spent a lot of time and I got some mentoring on everything I need to do to start the business. Okay. Okay. So there'd been a bit of mentoring about running a business and having a business. Um, it's just a, it's a decent set of skills that are different mm -hmm. from your medicine set of skills that you've just spent time crafting and honing. And I'm just curious about the, that, and then the model. So the, the 15 minute appointments, was that because of that um, difference between like overheads and costs as per how much you'd be earning? Is that why you chose the 15 minute? Yes. Um, it, well, there are a number of different reasons. Like a lot of the derm visits you can do okay in 15 minutes and we mm -hmm. didn't have the EMR back then. So it's not mm -hmm. too difficult to chart, but definitely was also to have a certain amount of revenue based on overhead costs. And when I started out, I saw about 30, 33 patients in a day, mm -hmm. which is actually fairly modest for a dermatologist. Mm -hmm. And then after um, that sort of halfway mark, when I actually thought about selling my practice, but I didn't, mm -hmm. um, I went to 25 a day. So yeah. that was definitely better. Okay. Okay. What were you missing out on in your uh, outside of medicine life priorities in that four and a half year mark? What do you think that was looking like for you? Do you mean what was 
when I was working as a dermatologist, what yeah, was Yeah, so you're working all day and then you're there in the evening doing the other hat of administrative role mm-hmm. and billing and coding. Like there's not enough time left for eating and sleeping, <laughs> I'm thinking, mm-hmm. socializing, being with others. Well, I would say after that period of time, that was sort of a win. That was probably about a year. But mm-hmm. after my office manager came back and we kind of got humming again, I had good work-life balance. So I would say when I made a lot of changes, because when I was unhappy and really thinking about selling the practice, I said, all right, fix it up before you give it up. Do everything you can to be happier before you decide to leave. And and I did a lot of things. I even changed what I was offering. I added Mm -hmm. services such as I had estheticians who did acne Mm -hmm. treatments, skin Mm -hmm. rejuvenation. I learned peels. I did a lot of sclerotherapy. So I tried to diversify Mm -hmm. what I was doing. But I I have to be honest, I had good work-life balance. Mm -hmm. And I I said when I sold the practice, it was as sweet as it could be. It was Mm -hmm. cash and Medicare. I had a day off a week. I went home at 536. I had the weekends in dermatology call. The only time I got called really was for a there was a famous actress in town and she had a pimple and she was mm-hmm. on the movie set and they wanted yeah. me to inject it. <laughs> like that's okay. what call was. Yeah. Got it. All right. So you'd taken a place, you got to a place where it was not sustainable. It wasn't fun. You weren't happy. You weren't, um, but you still had some life balance. And then you said, I changed it up and made it good. So you went down to 25 a day mm-hmm. and then you increase the number of people working within your center Presumably they were bringing in some income as well mm-hmm. at that point. Yeah, yeah. good. Mm-hmm. Um, going home at 5.30, done. So what is that? what did you need to do differently to get that for you? Well, actually getting off of a lot of insurance was helpful because mm-hmm. it simplified things. My staff could help me more. Um, mm-hmm. I also, with the charting, it really, without the EMR, it was pretty simple. I could finish it usually when I was in the patient room. Mm -hmm. And the business, you know, things that took more time was when I had to hire somebody new or train someone new, or we were bringing on like new type of procedures Mm -hmm. into the practice. But I think it was a lot simpler than practices for people these days. Patients couldn't, didn't message you. There was no email. There weren't texts. There weren't these messaging platforms. So, I mean, I'm a dinosaur, (laughs) really. I mean, from an era that a lot of people don't even know about. Yeah, but that's important to recognize that those extra things, like every extra thing you're doing within your day is adding a time cost right? So keeping the model simple, keeping your accessibility less accessible, Mm -hmm. actually created more time for you and more fun and more enjoyment within your day by the sounds of it. It was definitely better. And I think a key point is though, that even at the end when this was sweet and anyone looking from the outside would be like, oh my God, derma holiday. Why would anybody leave? Just pop some Botox, you know, freeze some warts. Uh, you're good. The thing is, it, I kept wanting to see how little I could work. Mm-hmm. Can I go down to three days? And when I would see my day, I would be like, okay. <laughs> even though I love the people and there were mm-hmm. things I definitely liked, I knew it was wrong for me to continue because it's not right to the patients. That's mm-hmm. somebody whose energy isn't expansive and wanting to keep learning more and growing and being there. And that's what you're what you're there for. So I felt like this isn't right for the patients. It's not right for me. I don't know what to do, but this needs to change. Got it. Okay. No, that's interesting and and a de- decent um, reflection for us to understand why at four days a week were you still looking for an exit and then you were looking for three days a week and making it um, clear to yourself that you weren't invested now in staying and doing as much as you had been doing. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you sold the practice and then you had some time off to reflect. So what did you do in that time? Yes, Sarah. Do you want a multiple choice? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. A is I went on a ship, at, like a small boat and sailed around the world. 
B is I went and lived in a cabin and C is I got a job at the public health department. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you do all three or were you just, no, that's a, your multiple choice. Like, what, like, <laughs> I get a, to like, like, what you did. like wait, well, wait, don't tell like me you... kind of question. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you went for the escape. Was that what you were looking for? I did. I did. I went and um, I moved out to the country and I lived in a cabin. I called it the pumpkin house because yeah. I just, I felt like, okay, I planned my career. It didn't work out. Um, I, a relationship ended uh, that didn't work out. And I feel like I need to figure myself out a little bit more before I do a next thing. Cause I really felt like if I chose something now, it was going to be wrong. <laughs> and I didn't want to go down another path path and zigzag. Did you have any mentors or uh, people in your life who are helping you within that final year of that practice and then the next kind of steps? Was there anyone influential there? Uh, no. And if you ask my mother, she'll tell you that I don't want anyone to tell me what to do. So, so it's more like I told my family what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And my family has always been pretty hands off because that's how we were raised. So just make your own mistakes, chart your own course. We're not going to tell you what to do. And so they, they ask questions, but they were never like some parents like, oh no, you better have a job before you leave this one. Or what are you doing? You're crazy. Let's take you to the therapist's office and talk about this. <laughs> so, so no, I didn't have any mentors. That could have been a good idea. No, that's okay. I'm just curious. Um, and then I'm interested that you said my career didn't work out. Like you said, how you feel like it ended? Mm -hmm. Not really. I think it was meant to be. Okay. Um, I, you know, if you, if you wanted to hear a little bit more, the truth is I never really wanted to go to medical school. <laughs> I just, I, I thought I was going to be a veterinarian and mm -hmm. then I worked for one in high school and I realized I don't want to do things to people's animals. And so mm -hmm. I kind of lost my direction. It took me till my junior year in college mm -hmm. to take a chem course and I I could do it. And a, mm -hmm. a friend of mine in the course, so why don't you go pre-med? So it became more, I decided to go pre-med rather than I decided to be a physician. And that doesn't mean I regret doing it. I feel really lucky, mm -hmm. really lucky to have been a dermatologist but it wasn't where I was meant to end up permanently. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, so if you get advice from others, it's not your way. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. All right. So you go to this cabin in the woods. Now, many of us in the pain of our day think a cabin in the woods, the pumpkin house sounds amazing. <laughs> like, shut out the world. <laughs> right. My space. Tell right. us about the, the escape. Is it as good as it sounds? It was absolutely what I needed. <laughs> I call okay. it the Walden Pond without the pond. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it just gave me time to slow down, to reflect. And during that time, I was doing a lot of things that I think ended up helping me in this direction of being a coach. So I did a lot of meditation. I did a lot of spiritual reading. I did some practices that help you increase your intuition and when I was ready to figure out what was next, I, when I've had enough time, and I had enough time after I've had enough time in the cabin, mm -hmm. I just said, okay, I'm ready to stop volunteering. Cause I'd done a lot of volunteering during that time. Let me know what's next. And I found it in two weeks. Wow. That's very interesting. How long was enough time in the cabin? It was two years, two yeah, years. Two years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two years of soul searching mm -hmm. and doing some volunteer work. And then you found your answer in two weeks. So what was the answer that you found? Well, I was, I was in the library out in this country um, town called Marble Falls. And I was waiting for a Giardia test to come back from this kitten that I was fostering. And they closed for a couple hours during lunch out in the country. So I went in the library, Sarah, and I found this audio CD called the passion test. Mm -hmm. And on the way home, I was listening to it. And then I started writing out the test when I went home on my back porch. And the question is, when you're living your ideal life, what are you having, being and doing? So I started going through this test. And in the middle of it, I, I said, I just threw it up in the air and I never finished. And I said, this is what I want to do. 
I want to help people figure out how to live their best life and what their passion is. And then I started Googling coaching programs. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So then you moved into the coaching space. So tell us about the positions or, or people that you're working with and the kind of some of the things that you've discovered about this passion process. Uh, lovely. Well, so Sarah, as you can imagine, there are a lot of unhappy physicians, <laughs> as you know, as you, as you, you help them with their charting and like finding ways to be happy in medicine that I've probably worked with physicians from almost every specialty mm -hmm. and it runs the gamut from a resident who is really wondering whether they can go on with residency mm -hmm. to early career, mid career, late career, close to retirement. And that could be someone who really feels medicine was the wrong choice mm -hmm. to someone who loves their patients, but they're burdened by all the administrative hassles mm -hmm. to someone who knows that they've done this. It's been good for them, but they need to get out. So the whole spectrum mm -hmm. and my goal, my role is really as a guide to help them figure out their best answer. I don't have any type of agenda like, mm -hmm. um, I, you should stay in medicine or yes, you need to leave. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I really try to help them find their own answer. Yeah. I like that. I know that when I was looking for my own, um, fix for the paperwork and administrative burden. Uh, I went looking for physician coaches and all I could find in the world was what I had interpreted to be uh, physician coaches who are helping physicians leave medicine, like the transitioning coach. Oh. Um, and when I had um, looked into that, I didn't have another skill set. I didn't have any other way to support my family. I'm the sole income owner. So I had to stay and figure it out. So that was kind of the beginning of my journey in the area of like, well, how do we create something that is going to fit within the clinical day hours? Uh, that was what I was personally looking for within this journey. So it's interesting that you have that position of not, not having any agenda, whether you want to stay or go, it doesn't matter. And I, I agree. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely not going to tell a physician they have to stay in medicine or anybody. Mm -hmm. However, um, many of the physicians want to stay. They want to figure it out. Sure. And you're seeing all of the spectrum. You're seeing the ones that are, am I even in the right career to, do I need to leave or do I need to redesign myself or figure myself out? What are some of the, the pearls of wisdom um, coming from those discussions that you're having? Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks. That's a great question, Sarah. A couple of things. I would say when you're really burnt out, sometimes you can't make that decision and you need some space. Some people actually need to leave, take a leave of absence, because how you feel at this moment is going to be different. It's just like if you had a, a bad patient outcome. That's a terrible time to, you know, say, okay, I'm leaving medicine. Or if you get into a lawsuit because it's, you're, you're traumatized. And, and so to give yourself space and time to make that decision and to also know that there's a process you can go through to figure out what to do. For example, some physicians feel like I have to figure out the thing that I'm going to go to and know that this is going to be right because I can't mm. make a mistake. And so they they put a lot of pressure on themselves to get it right. But the, but you can zig. You actually can zig and zag, and that's mm -hmm. okay. And the other thing I, I would say is that there are so many options. Like I've had so many people come to me and say, Heather, I need to get out. <laughs> I think I need to be a medical writer. Can we look at options? Tell me how to do this. And then we start to realize that they actually – have this heart for medicine, they want to stay, maybe they're having anxiety, the imposter syndrome, perfectionism, as you know, you you know all these things. And then when we work with them, those things, they start feeling better and they find their way. So just, I would say, if you're questioning things, honor it, honor your feelings and give yourself space to find your own answer because it, it doesn't even have to take a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear that a lot. The responsibility liability is one of the things that you were 
concentrating on as you told your story at that four and a half year mark was it was a heavy burden to carry um, and then the patient the caring for the patients um, does that go away is it a teachable skill what do you tend to find with that um, when physicians or clinicians are burdened by those sorts of questions mm -hmm. Uh, so you're mainly asking about the liability and the responsibility. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That burden yeah. on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. I, I think that really varies. I definitely think it's a spectrum that mm -hmm. there are certain people who absolutely just cannot tolerate that risk. And, and that could be, it could be anyone who's a family practice physician to someone who's an orthopedic surgeon. I've had, you know, especially if you work with surgeons, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, sometimes the poor outcomes, which you're going to have, it's not your fault, mm -hmm. are too much. I remember one physician telling me, I feel like I have this wagon of people who I've tried to help, but it hasn't been an ideal outcome and I'm pulling them around and mm -hmm. they're following me everywhere I go. And I can't add one more person to that wagon. So it could be someone like that, or it could be someone who just has a lot of anxiety and they perseverate and they try therapy and they're maybe even on some medication and they do yoga and breathing and they're like, nope, don't want to do it. But I'd say for most physicians who want to be in medicine, it can be managed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. There's more than one tool here. Coaching is one of the possible um, pieces of the toolbox we talk about coaching not replacing your doctor or your medications. There's so many things that we may need in order to find our best way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So important. Love that. Um, all right. How would you start? So how would you, uh, if you had someone who was in that day questioning everything, what would you say is a good space to start or a place to start for them? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's an excellent question. I like to do a couple of things. The first thing is I like to add something we're very familiar with. What is your chief complaint? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is what is bothering you enough to reach out for help? We start to understand that and then we start to fill in the context. How did you get into medicine? What was your motivation? It's it's helpful if maybe you're not working with someone to tell your story. Tell your story story to somebody, write it down, start looking at the arc of it because that'll maybe help remind you why you went into medicine in the first place, and then be willing to let go of assumptions. Because there are a lot of assumptions such as, if I leave medicine, my income's going to go down, mm. or um, people are going to be disappointed in me, or if I do this or that, or maybe even retrain, then you know, it's not, it might not even work out. So there are a lot of assumptions we can make. So I would say first gather information because it's interesting. A lot of people who feel like they have to leave, they've built up these emotions for years and they're about to burst. So they feel like they have to do something or they just feel it's too overwhelming. They can't do anything. Mm. But once people start to see that if they did need to leave, there's a path their options. They're not going to be on the street corner selling pencils. Yes, we can make a good income. It's a pressure relief valve. And so mm. once we release that with actual facts and reality-based thinking, often it can help them recalibrate and find ways to change their current situation. I see that happening a fair amount. Yeah, that's very interesting. I like that because I think you're right. The the overwhelm and the stuckness and a lot of the things you mentioned um, would really burden somebody thinking about how could I even make changes here? How, how would it be possible? Um, and not being right, like you said before, so mm -hmm. important. The, um, the needing to find the right thing or know it will work out. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we put that expectation on ourselves, knowing that there's an obstacle course in front of us if we're going to make changes. Right. That's a great metaphor because when we became a physician, the steps were clear. We could see them. We could see mm. the whole staircase. And I love this quote by Martin Luther King. He said, take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. And that's 
how it is when we are transitioning or trying to do a combination of non-clinical clinical it's there are a lot of options so it can feel like bushwhacking mm -hmm. yeah even in the staying like even if you're going to stay in your position and your space but you're going to make changes it's still a staircase in front of you. It's still not a clear mm -hmm. path. Yeah, so important. How do people find you if they're looking to work with you? You can go to the doctorscrossing.com website. That's doctorscrossing.com. And there are free resources there. There's a freebie tab for people if they're interested in lots of different topics. We have PDFs there. That's probably the best way to reach me is there. You can also reach me at the Doctors Crossing. I'm sorry. You can also find me on LinkedIn. You can message me on LinkedIn. Uh, we could also, can I redo that part? Mm -hmm. We would redo that part if you just mm -hmm. ask what I say. Um, yes, there are a number of ways you can reach me. One is to go to the doctorscrossing.com website. That's doctorscrossing.com. And if someone's in interested in scheduling a consultation, there's a scheduling tab and there's a link you can click on for information. You can also reach out to us at team at doctorscrossing.com, T-E-A-M at doctorscrossing.com. I'm also active on LinkedIn. So feel free to invite me to join your network. You can send me a message there. I'd love to hear from you. Perfect. Is there anything that we didn't talk about today that you would like to make sure that listeners are able to hear and learn today? Uh, thank you, Sarah. I would say that if someone is questioning things and maybe they're not sure what to do, to just go ahead and take a step to get help, you know, whether that's reach out to you for help with the charting join a Facebook group, talk to someone, but there's always a way forward. And like I said, I've worked with so many hundreds and hundreds of people. And I, I feel like everybody can be helped. Even one hour conversation can be transformative. So don't, don't ever do what I hear physicians saying to me quite a lot is, Heather, can, can you just give me a mind trick? So I so I can feel okay with my situation. Like they might be, they might be lying on the couch Sunday afternoon because they're depressed that Monday's coming. They're going, can you just fix my mind some way? <laughs> you know, no, it's, that's never the answer. <laughs> not just in your head. <laughs> no, it's not just in your head. Do something, take an action step to make a concrete change so that tomorrow you're feeling like you're moving forward. Yeah, I like that. I think you're right. That even a, a one hour conversation with someone, um, or even like you said, the writing things down with those great questions you gave us of where to start. If they're hearing in their head, like you were saying, I'm not happy. Like if if you could identify, I'm not happy here. Mm -hmm. um, I think those, those pieces, it, it doesn't have to take a lot to start to be curious about what else could be possible for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so interesting. Yeah. Anything else? Mm -hmm. The other thing I'm working on right now is the uh, it's going to be a course for physician mm -hmm. at the crossroads. I'm planning to launch it in the fall of twenty of this year, mm -hmm. and it's going to be very extensive. It will give people a whole understanding of options. It'll have examples of physicians being happier in clinical practice ones who are doing a blendini, ones who have transitioned. So that course will be launching, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, cross my fingers, in the fall. And if people want to be on the waiting list for that and hear about it, we have a wait list that you can just contact us at team at doctorscrossing.com. And I also have a podcast uh, that I do on a weekly basis, the Doctors Crossing Carpe Diem podcast. We interview lots of physicians who are finding different ways to be happy. So they could definitely check out the podcast on Spotify and wherever great podcasts are found like yours. I love your podcast. You have five-star ratings or excellent interviews. Wonderful. That sounds great. Thank you so much for being here and for giving people hope that they could have changed, even if it's within clinical or if it's transitioning or moving out of medicine, that there are so many possibilities. We don't have to even know what they are in order to start a conversation internally or 
externally. So thank you so much for being here, Heather. Oh, it's my pleasure. And thank you so much for having me, Sarah. I'm truly honored. Perfect. Thank you for being part of the Sustainable Clinical Medicine podcast. If you'd like to learn more or join us to help you get home with today's work done, go to chartingcoach.ca. There you'll find all the information on the premier lifetime access charting champions program that is helping physicians get home with today's work done with all the proven tools, support and community you need to create time for your life outside of medicine. We would love to see you there. Until next time, thanks for listening.